a significant role to play in uh, making biotic stresses uh, not a big limitation for enhancing production and productivity. So biotic stresses are the major facts which we need to keep in mind. As we progress my, in my lecture, I would be further enhancing my thought process about it. And this is a farmer. Can you make it a little bigger? Uh, if anybody needs to see it bigger, you can reduce the... Okay, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Now, grow more has been a clamor of the 60s and 70s because we were short of food. We, we know the stories of all of us, our grandfathers and parents would have been explaining us how the country went through difficult times. And we went into a plan called intensive agriculture, which we, has now become commercial agriculture. And now the market drive, which makes us to make our farms to be commercially viable, with a lot of value chain concepts brought in, to make the um, you know aspiration of the government policy of doubling of farmers' income, future trading and commodity exchanges, and including the participation in the world trade order by exporting a large number of commodities from our country, we have become a global community participant in uh, food supply system. If we look at the uh, United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization statistics, the uh, production and productivity of various cereals, including rice and wheat, and food grains, if I say so, as uh, pulses and oil seeds also, have a strong influence on the world food price. So it, it is important for us to realize that our st status and stature in the global scenario of food systems has grown enormously. And uh, to feed the hungry, Globally has become a motto. Next, please. Next, please. Please move on. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So now the question is intensive agriculture. What for? Is it for WTO? And commercial agriculture, when we talk about, is it for uh, looking for safe food? So, you know, there is a diabolic problem in the market systems, be it for global system or for a domestic system, the safety and quantity for profitability. These three keywords are uh, the, the difficulties for biotech stress managers in the world, country as well as across the world to, to, to stabilize and balance the whole thing in order to assure uh, a very homogeneous production in the uh, cereals and food items what we have. Next, please. Please move on. Yeah, crop biotic stresses, which I have been mentioning in the beginning, has a lot of uh, intonations in commercial agriculture. Profitability is one system which we need to keep in mind. And are we hopeful of crop health management tools to produce risk-free food? Okay. This is the question we all need to keep while doing this killing process. How much of management tools in crop health sustenance during a crop growing period of say 40 to 180 to 250 days, according to the types of crops or even the perennial crops as in the case. Yes, please. Please move on. Please move on. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Please move on. Yeah, you know, what is pestilence all about? We all worry about biotic stress. Biotic stresses are due to pests. Pests can be microbial or macrobial, including from large animals to small insects. Crop herbivory is a process in nature, as much as what we hunt for food, 
all these organisms also live on a set of other uh, herbivorous uh, systems like plants. Crop plants also become one production system for them to enjoy the benefits of nutrition. Next, please. Yeah. So coming back to the production and risks, where agrochemicals stand. Agrochemicals have been discovered for uh, uh, unhindered commodity production cycles. Okay. It could be intensive agriculture by three crop rice, two crop rice, okay, and um, rice wheat cropping systems, various types of cropping systems we dis implemented to the extent that it can, it has reached in farming systems also. A number of farming systems are available in Assam like states, which take in crops and animals and other uh, enterprises to make the uh, happiness of farmers, farm families increase considerably. When the unhindered commodity production and the ecology of production with conflicts, we get into all the discussions about impact on human health, impact on environment and things like that. Next, please. To be very brief about it, if you all can appreciate ourselves, we as agricultural um, persons have been have to realize a point that we are intruding into nature while practicing agriculture. Okay, so if that is the basics, uh, uh, basic uh, hypothesis in which we practice agriculture, how minimalized interventions are there in natural systems to get best of the natural forces to benefit for agriculture production and productivity, that is what we look for. While practicing agricultural use of agro agrochemicals, there is a very interesting um, phraseology called good agricultural practices. It has a, a set of definitions. I am limiting my, my, my concepts to agrochemicals, which is our theme of the day. What are the perceived risks in good agricultural practices? What is good agricultural practice? An agrochemical with a desired use pattern on the label containing information on the dosage on the target pests and the target crops that is called good agricultural practice in, in the use of uh, agrochemicals okay uh, risk-free commodity production is the insurance which we are trying to bring in by following good agricultural practices so all our extension activities for increased production should have this basic tenet or hypothesis ingrained in the farm family's mind that uh, using agrochemicals more and more is not going to be uh, increasing more and more profits. So there is a uh, break even point beyond which the production and productivity and profitability will decline. So the perceived risks and gap is what I thought of discussing for a while. Please go ahead. Next, please. Yeah, this is an information I thought of sharing with all of you that there is a Bureau of Indian Standard um, standard which has been fixed for India Gap. India Gap, I was also part of this uh, formulation of India Gap for this country, and this has two uh, uh, what you call applications. One is for the World Trade Order. We need to keep our India Gap ready for the countries of import of our commodities to analyze what kind of practices we have followed to produce a given commodity which is being offered for export. The other thing is internally also for the safety of agricultural uh, practices we need a gap and that is the standard which has been finalized by the Bureau of Indian Standards. All agricultural universities should download it, make it as a practice while uh, you know, making their packages of practice and also for uh, uh, the advocacy of those packages of practice to the farmers and other stakeholders. Next, please. <clears throat> now, now, the issues in uh, GAP, which are very explicitly talked about by uh, professors, students, and um, uh, manufacturing companies and their field staff, the pesticide dealers, everybody. 
label claim. As I told you, there is a GAP expressed on the label of the pesticide container, be it a packet of a carton box or metallic container or plastic container, whatever. There are stipulations for labels while undertaking the registration process of the given pesticide uh, chemistry. Then <clears throat> the labels should be the one with the plant protection products, what I call as PPPs in crops to be extremely religiously followed. There cannot be any variability which needs to be uh, thought about in you know, ab bringing aberrations of any kind. <clears throat> so uh, essentially what I want to emphasize is in our extension plan, our uh, friends from the uh, advisory community of the di uh, directorates of agriculture, horticulture of the state government, as well as KVKs, as well as university extension uh, you know, uh, group, all of them should have this as a formula for um, <clears throat> declaring agrochemicals to be of helpful uh, ingredients and inputs for crop production. The application technologies, as we go along in our lecture, we will be able to still understand the improvements we have been bringing in pesticide application technologies. I always used to say our child with the university professors and research institutes in ICR that we are not to bathe the plants, crop plants with pesticide diluted solutions or formulations. We only need to apply in spray into a particle size which can hit the insects or the fungal mycelia or bacterial spores and kill them based on the toxicity of the chemical. Indiscriminate and injurious applications, be it fertilizer or um, uh, agrochemicals, I mean pesticides, are all of equal harm to both the crops, which I will explain to you in due course, as well as to the uh, environment, where soil, water, other biota, everything is involved. Ignorance-led diagnosis. Now, this is something which is very significant for me because in GAP, servicing, we need to be very precise about diagnosis of the biotic stress. We have examples of the recent times, a month or a couple of months back, we had a very huge problem of uh, in chili crop of Andhra Pradesh, where they didn't know what the organism is and they went about spraying 22 times per uh, a month to the extent. And when it was finally understood that it is only thrips which have come, and a species which is endemic to thrips in uh, endemic to chilies in this region, Isle Sima and uh, such of those regions of the uh, uh, Andhra Telangana border. We realized that the pesticides which were extensively deployed were useless for the purpose for which it was targeted. So, ignorance led diagnosis is very important, and pesticide dealers or the uh, market people who are handling pesticides should have a part of skilling of NAHEP as much as what AAU is taking up for uh, the research and extension staff of the universities of, across the country. We should have similar programs for pesticide uh, handlers, right from the um, sales and marketing people of the companies to the dealers and progressive farmers. I always advocate this as a very important uh, step for enhancing the knowledge skill and the um, literacy on use of agrochemicals. Inappropriate spray protocols. Now, um, somebody has a very peculiar habit of no all ideology for in the farmers, families, as well as in the um, extension system that you should alternate a fungicide with a insecticide to get the best, what you call, um, beautiful crop. Everybody calls it beautiful crop. I don't understand the word beautiful for that. Are we keeping the crops to be, uh, you know, uh, lipstick or powder, is it an important point which we need to introspect? And of course, in recent times, over the last about two, two and a half decades, we have synthetic pesticides being contaminated with biological pesticides. 
I, I always say this way because all, while Dr. Jitendra Kumar explained about the biopesticides having um, what you call misbranding or contamination of chemical synthetic pesticides, the reverse is the way it is happening in quantum, in quantities. They will have a green label, but maximum quantitative content will be synthetic pesticides and there will be a little of some of the ingredients of biopesticides, be it a neem based or other botanicals or microbials. Next please. So these issues being flagged now, I wanted to go to the information gap which we have. You know, agrochemicals are used in crops, in crop fields, in storage and in public health, mind you. We have a large expanse of use of insecticides because a number of things for vector management in public health and in crops as well as in storage for securing our food commodities properly from stored uh, grain uh, biotic stresses, both pathogens as well as insects and mites. So a lot of chemistries, sequences of applications, status of GAP. Please try to analyze through the knowledge now being provided in this program to understand how your package of practice of your university and what you are speaking to the farming community in your regions are going to be uh, aligned and see that there is a safety system which is brought into the whole ideology of use of agrochemicals. Go ahead, please. Next. Yeah, we know this very well. Why that is why we are here in the skilling process and program. Applicators are available today. We have come up to the stage of use of drones, as somebody was mentioning in the morning. Uh, yeah, drones are important, but. Do we have, as Dr. Jitender told about, the right formulations for drone application technology? I am one of those developing consultants for drone companies, which have come up with a good amount of machines for uh, covering all types of canopies from arachna to paddy. If we can see the variations in the crop heights, uh, everywhere drones have been found to be useful and applying pesticides in a precise manner. This is the fundamental uh, advantage we are looking for by deploying drones. Precision, quickness, and accuracy. If these three things are assured, our plant protection becomes much, much uh, relaxed and useful and more smarter. Smarter in the uh, ways in the days to come. A lot of developmental activities are going on. Policy support has come from both Civil Aviation Ministry as well as from the Agriculture Ministry in the deployment of drones. Uh, drones, as you would have seen, the last Republic Day Parade uh, uh, beating the retreat program, thousands of drones were deployed for making people understand, the civil uh, system understand that drones can become our way of life for uh, medical support, delivery of uh, medicines, advisories, and more so for me, drones are going to be of huge use in plant protection for deploying sensors to detect pests and diseases infestation in large areas, like a whole village, whole uh, block. If we can map the pestilence, that would give us opportunities for sh sharing alerts with the farm families and the advisory system. So drones have a lot of applications which are come in due course of time in our uh, life we are going to see. And application of pesticides will also become one of the uh, useful application of drones in our uh, agriculture. Next, please. Yeah, coming to the pesticide, we all know about it, but I wanted to flag that this agricultural skilling, which we, agrochemical skilling which you have, has a strong bias because entomology department of the AAU has uh, piloted it. They have reduced uh, their uh, emphasis on herbicides and fungicides, but I would say all are equal in terms of biotic stress management. I will come back to that because of time. Why herbicide for me are more significant in crop protection than uh, others. That's why I've put it in first in the sequence which I have written here. And fungicides are also equally important, especially the modern molecules which we have. And uh, many of your pathology colleagues will be agreeing with me to understand that the, the metabolic changes happening in the system 
have a lot of importance to be considered for these two groups of pesticides which we are handling in a large measure in the modern agricultural system, particularly in states like Assam. Yes, please. <clears throat> yeah, this is a very fundamental knowledge of the UG classes. But I thought of flagging because the variety of chemistries which we handle are this broad and wide. So uh, it's not so simple to align yourself to a one brand name of a pesticide and then say you spray or apply it in soil or uh, uh, dip it in uh, that particular formulation. You have to go a little beyond like pharmacopoeia of the uh, medical system or veterinary system, human health and veterinary system, where they go into a little more details about the chemistries to decide upon the mode of action and then prescribe pesticides at given points of pestilence in the crops. As I wanted to emphasize only on those uh, that aspect of this when we say, we just have a very casual and uh, very, very, uh, you know, uh, uh, overall idea about all these, but we don't follow it in a meticulous manner to understand which kind of chemistries are important to start with in a crop season and which sorts of chemistries will be better if we deploy it in a later stage of the crop growth, etc. etc. Thank you. Next, please. Yeah, these are some of the latest molecules which we have got registered as Dr. Jitendra Kumar was telling Director IPFT about the 299, we are touching 300 uh, chemistries which are going to be registered in due course of time. See, some of these chemistries have a very different uh, mode of action and uh, the, the quantum of pesticide application can be drastically re reduced by deploying some of these uh, chemistries. They thought of uh, just flagging in. And all of you should always be, uh, you know, familiar with the, uh, the the latest products which are there available in the Directorate of Plant Protection Quarantine website and make yourself updated about it instead of some company wala coming or a dealer wala coming and talking to you. You all should be yourself educating about the new molecules which are being uh, registered in the country for deploying in the different parts of the country. Next please. Yeah, now this is one I thought of differing with Dr. Professor yeah. Badal and all of you that agrochemicals have a composite <laughs> nature. Growth hormones, plant growth hormones also. Like, fortunately, AU has got agrochemical division in biochemistry department. It's very interesting for me because I thought that that is where the research we miss out in a holistic manner on the influence of these on the plant's metabolism. What changes we bring in due to the various chemistries which I earlier showed you. So this I thought we should have in a, in a sensitive manner in this skilling program. What are the favoring agents, uh, situations we bring in for pest buildup itself by deploying some of our chemicals and altering the metabolism of the um, uh, crops. Please come back to the presentation. Is there any difficulty? Next, please. Next, please. Yeah. We have a lot of regulatory processes in the country which are, you will be uh, spoken with in large measure and as I told you we have the uh, primary regulations of insecticides or, or although it is a misnomer to say insecticide, the Insecticide Act is actually Pesticide Act and the current bill which is in parliament will encompass all those things. I, am also, I was also part of a uh, system where it, this original draft was made pesticide management bill and insecticide acts is the one uh, and their rules are the one which controls the uh, use of pesticides in the country and then um, the collateral uh, regulations like food security and food safety uh, are uh, also to be aligned to these this regulation of use of pesticides use of uh, agrochemicals next please we have also fertilizer control order of the section 3 of the uh, the, the Essential Commodities Act, 
uh, all of these are the management tools for and policy positions for use of agrochemicals in the country. Now, risk assessment process. This also in detail, many people will be speaking to you on the reference body weight, food consumption, average daily intake, and the pesticide residues in the raw agriculture commodities we leave with in the marketed products which we are uh, consuming. And a crucial point is about the pre-harvest interval. In GAP, I would emphasize on this particular aspect for the farmers to follow. As per the label which is given, what is the last application to be done of a given pesticide recommended for a given pest, uh, pest control of a particular biotic stress, be it a disease causing organism or a insect or a mite or a nematode. So pre-harvest interval is to be very crucially kept in mind to prevent all kinds of health hazards which we otherwise doubt about agrochemicals. See, uh, next please. Uh, as we uh, go along, we will realize that uh, the detoxification mechanism, when we consume a poison, leave alone agrochemicals, in our food, we consume so many things, you know, unwanted things we consume inadvertently. But there is a body which is uh, safeguarding us from ra ra large risks and uh, safely move along in our life to carry forward our uh, metabolic requirements and life activities. So in the case of plants also similar detoxification mechanisms are available. Our mitochondria in the uh, liver or kid, uh, in the plants, the mitochondria of the cells are the oxidative or hydrolytic oxidative mechanisms available. Uh, I mean, detoxification mechanisms available. And nature has provided enough strength and uh, support for this purpose. So, uh, fighting with uh, pests and diseases, keeping, we have to keep in mind this detoxification metabolism in the crop. Any pesticide which we are using is a toxin. Toxins are toxic to all living beings. This is an axiom which we need to keep in mind. It's not a hypothesis, it's a real truth. Toxins are required. You take any antibiotic or any drugs which you are prescribed by the doctor. There is a dosage, there is an interval for consumption, and then they are asking you to stop. Knowing fully well the precautionary aspects of the health hazards of that particular given drug. drug. With this pandemic which we have seen, we saw the showering of drugs which came into the market uh, of the uh, counter prescriptions and consumptions and the health hazards we endured. Many of our uh, family members had to in invite death because of the abuse of various drugs. A very similar plan is there in uh, agriculture crop plants also. So this detoxification mechanism of a, say, a use of a herbicide, for example, I always emphasize because original research for the discovery of herbicides were from crop, I mean, plant hormones. Okay, so hormones are having a legitimate use, but if they are used in larger measures, the adversities are bound to happen for the plant itself, and it can drag the plant's growth in some way or the other. Although the claims of recovery and uh, you know, betterment is there by the crop husbandry group of our uh, community of professionals. But still, we need to understand that there is a drag in the uh, growth pattern of crops, even if they are post-emergent herbicides that are being recommended. Now, another concept which I also again want to infuse into you is when you use a herbicide, change or altered metabolism of the crop can make their defense also weaker, with which pests and diseases can take over. You know, this entire biome is full of organisms. All our opportunists, including us, our opportunism is to uh, harvest, to grow a crop and get the most uh, or the best yields for a profitable agriculture. The same is true for all the herbivores. All the herbivores compete with each other, as I had told in the earlier slide. Herbivory is a competitive uh, process in nature. So, 
all these weakening of the top plants metabolism can induce an, a set of cascading effects of other set of biotic stresses to come into the crop production cycle so please as agrochemical servicing system we i i appeal to all of you to become a holistic agriculturist okay the the enduring uh, arguments about uh, against agrochemicals the talk about the organic or non chemical systems etc are all based on the frustration we have brought into the system of enhanced and injudicious and baseless use of agrochemicals next please <clears throat> yeah i felt that this killing system should make assam as an example and all the other participants from various states should also take over uh, a similar thought process which i am now proposing on the environmental impact of pesticide chemistries in uh, the visavi that of the packages of practice your social science uh, group can help uh, help us in uh, you know designing certain investigations of this kind on uh, impact assessments and uh, as bio biological people we should also participate in those impact assessment processes and see in the villages what kind of impact we have on the water bodies on the aquatic life on the terrestrial life on the forest fringing forest on the agroforestry which we tout and propagate in the uh, uh, the cropping systems we talk about in the holism of the whole matter the pesticide business houses and universities can work together on the environmental impact to reduce the adverse comments and in baseless you know conclusions with a lot of people in the fr fringing system take out to fight uh, i mean to to propose that agricultural agrochemicals are bad they are going to leave a lot of bad effects on the health of environment and humans next please <clears throat> Now this I have spoken earlier. We please move on. Yeah, this is one area which I thought of flagging for the safety and risk assessment of pesticides. And when I say pesticides, herbicides, uh, fungicides, and insecticides have same level in understanding the uh, risk being uh, measured and quantified. To a level where we say maximum residue limit is the one which we should have at, for the end product commodity at harvest, so that it is possible to be consumed with confidence of no adverse effect, zero adverse effect. So, how is it uh, that we are uh, able to educate the consumers as well as the farmers? After all, the farmers are also consumers of their own commodities. So, in uh, bringing excess use of agrochemicals, what risks they are finally ending up with in the uh, post-harvest scenario of commodities in uh, consumption of our food, especially for the vulnerable communities in our uh, society like children, uh, lactating mothers, women at large, See, they have a different physiology altogether in comparison to uh, the rest of the community and also the aging population, be it women, man or woman. So, the maximum residue limit is sort of a, a prescription of GAP which we will have to enforce for the harvested commodities at farm gate to see that the risk of consumption of that commodity due to any agrochemical being used in excess is zero. If this certification is possible by the farming families, aided by the pesticide industry, including the dealers and the university officials put together, I will call it organic farming. The entire gamut of organic production system ends with this that there is no poison in the commodity which is offered for consumption, which we can easily ensure if agrochemicals are still being used 
fertilizers are still being used, growth hormones are still being used in the appropriateness and judiciousness which we enforce under GA. So MRL has got two uh, different things as Dr. Jitendra Kumar casually mentioned about. There is one called regulatory MRL where we see that in trade or in markets we take samples. There is a national project. I think AAU is also still a center in entomology department for uh, residue estimates of the uh, market samples of various commodities, 21 commodities at a given point of time. We started in uh, 19 labs at that time. Now it has enlarged. Whatever. So that legal regulatory assessment and uh, uh, you know uh, control by the state agriculture department, horticulture departments to go back to enforce GAP in those excess used uh, blocks and villages and districts of the every state is the original plan by which we launched that national monitoring of pesticide residues. The other one is a trade where, as an importer country, I would say exporting country like India that you are such and such crop like bindi or um, uh, you know curry leaf or um, tomatoes have got certain pesticides in excess of what I in my country fix as an MRL I don't uh, I'm not obliged to respect your MRL of your country so there is a trade negotiation and price negotiation etc etc and this also is a tool which I call as trade MRL uh, largely practiced in WTO systems. Next, please. <clears throat> yeah, Food Safety Standard Act of 2012, which is the most recent uh, act of the country, along with the Food Security Act, they all were born at the similar time. The exposure limit, which I was explaining to you right away, was the kind of cons consensus we ended up for fixing MRLs of each of the pesticides for each of the crop where the labels are there. So consumer health protection is the fundamental uh, uh, responsibility of Food Safety Standard Authority of India under the Food Safety Act. And for uh, managing this uh, health protection as consumers, let us forget that we are all scientists, we are all um, you know, touted agents of agrochemical use. We also are consumers. Now, in your family, in our family, if we want safe food, what is the way we look for while shopping our commodities in the market? Do you have an FSSAI label, a FSSAI um, barcode information available? And with your mobile, can you read what that barcode information is all about? And then pick up the product and then use for consumption. Are we happy with it to that? God only can say us. We don't generally follow all these simple principles which the act and the rule and the authority have enforced. Even in PDS today, we have such kind of things which are being introduced for various commodities. Next, please. Yeah, when I saw your uh, curriculum, and that is why I thought of seeking it, I thought of finding this two interesting topics also being covered under agrochemicals which are actually sp speaking a um, what you call paradox <clears throat> because when you so talk about chemicals biological formulations don't come into picture except for the formulas like that they use for uh, botanical pesticides as a name or such of those where new products have come with the support of the institutions like IPFT and many other companies whose R&D have brought in a lot of uh, ready-to-use concentrates where you can just add the neem oil to uh, in, the, uh, in water and dilute it and instantly it becomes without any addition, addition of spreaders or uh, mixers or such of those chemicals. Except that particular aspect of the bio botanicals, uh, I don't find bioformulations to be importantly considered in this skilling program. but. I'm congratulating these organizers for uh, introducing it because the certain truths are, um, are needed for the skilling and knowledge enhancement of our uh, um, participants. One hard truth I have to say, when 299 pesticides are registered, only 28 are uh, in the bioformulation system. I don't know. 
Okay, this is important to be understood. That so small numbers are available. Oh, keep it up. Small numbers are available, and then the number of formulations are hardly anything for a country like ours. So when we find that there is a set of um, bioformulations overwhelmingly dependent upon for um, agro um, and pest management, we need to also understand that products are not there. <clears throat> and uh, very usefully and interestingly, I found that there is a topic which you want to please go to the next uh, about the farm level production of microbials. I thought, can you please enlarge a little more? Because I wanted to show this as an endeavor of a foundation which I strongly support. Dr. Professor Badal knows about this organization called Farmer, which is part of an ICR network group of uh, soil arthropods. This is a self designed fermenter designed by. Uh, Dr. Amulya Panda, uh, former director of NII, with the help of uh, you know local engineers in the and uh, fabricators in Ghaziabad, UP, and uh, this is a very handy thing for uh, production at farm level. <clears throat> Each family, when we talk about entrepreneurial agriculture, this is one of those where you can have uh, you know skilling of a youths. Uh, farm family youth for taking up such kind of uh, production system for all the microbial biopesticides and all the microbial biofertilizers. We can make them so self-sufficient. In one of the re most recent reports from Australia, we find that they can replace uh, uh, fertilizers with uh, locally produced biofertilizers. A number of organisms for uh, uh, nitrogen fixing, phosphorus, um, micronutrient mobilizing, potash mobilizing, all kind of organisms are readily available today. Or genetically modified non-GM organisms are also available, where your university has also taken some lead in research. <clears throat> we think that these kind of tools are very important for uh, making our uh, participants to understand the way in which it has moved forward. Uh, for uh, farm level production system. Anybody can fabricate all these kind of things at your own level. You need a stainless steel tank and some of these small gadgets which make logical production system possible for all the microbial uh, agro uh, uh, biotech stress managing tools which we have in our packages of practice which we can hardly make farmers use because of the non-availability, as I earlier slide explained to you, there are hardly any number of formulations available. Suppose I go to Gohati market or to Shillong market or to Yorhad market and pick up a few biological green label products and run a multi-residue analysis, you will find a lot of chemicals there. And I will not blame them for that because the farmer who has been habituated to quick kill process in crop production cannot wait for a week to make the pathogen, the entomopathogen to multiply and invade and then kill the pest. And he thinks that the damage, whatever extent is there, cannot be reduced with that. So the, the, the blame game happening with, like what we talked for against agrochemicals is also badly picturized for uh, biological products. <clears throat> the the entire system is not very very comfortable in terms of the use of uh, uh, biological pesticides and that is why we have difficulties and uh, before I end I will give you one more word of uh, advice in the matter of crop production next please yeah <clears throat> this is one thing I thought of finally asking all the participants to get get into thinking process is integrated pest management scientifically serviced. Asam, I put in bold uh, large case letters to replace it with any other state for that matter, where from these participants are. The principles of IPM, 
for field and horticultural crops, how much we are, um, you know, following, and uh, what is the GAP and the use judiciousness we bring in for crops, including vegetables and fruits. Why I say so is because these are the short duration, frequently picked crops. So as I said earlier, at harvest, if the um, terminal residue is uh, below maximum residue limit only, the safety of the con consumption is possible or in possible to be ensured. Then comes the monitoring of pesticide residues. And the last point, which is the crucial in plant protection, is the supervisory pest control, which we used to bring in in IPM for a long while. Suddenly, this has been lost in the debate and discussions on integrated pest management implementation. I would now appeal to universities like IAA, which are very highly progressive, to bring in CSR stewardship, corporate social responsibility stewardship of the manufacturers to bring in supervisory pest control. Means the joint responsibility of servicing of agrochemicals in farm, uh, in or in farms of all the villages. What is the strategy which we can design with your social science group and with your uh, extension group? Can we make some sort of a supervisory pest control, uh, you know, design and plan, and a policy of the state for that matter? I thought this should be one which uh, should be attracting your attention in large measure. You all can uh, introspect on this, debate on this through these 12 days and then understand what exactly can be the weapon or the tool which we need to use for judicious implementation of GAP and IPM. <clears throat> GAP for IPM, let me put it this way. Next please. <clears throat> yeah, before I thank you all, I wanted to also mention, which I was, please go back to the previous. <clears throat> uh, I wanted to tell you one thing very strongly about crop production. Crop husbandry is related to the natural elements, dependence on natural elements, be it air, water or soil. Soil for me is, as we have been told in our educational system, as an acronym, it is soul of infinite life. Soil is equal to soul of infinite life, which means it is a living thing. <clears throat> a huge amount of microbial systems are available. The plants have their own microbial systems. Animals have their own, including humans. And the latest publications in this regard has given us the indication, not only indication, the sure knowledge, that each cell is containing a lot of living organisms called bacteria. Each living cell will have a number of living organisms. If I say so, this is the truth of life in various publications in microbiology now. We get to read all this. A lot of Indian publications, what you call as forerunners in knowledge of these kinds have come in from Indian uh, researchers and it has been challenging the world knowledge levels for uh, calling unicellular and multicellular organisms. A lot of things are going on in our uh, life. So <clears throat> imagine a situation where crop husbandry is to enable nature to produce uh, an environment for best of crop production. If that is so, <clears throat> each crop physiology, each crops um, what you call adaptation to nature, including for mining nutrients from soil. I say mining because applied uh, in agriculture, we are taught to apply and then the plants are expected to get spoon fed. Is it that what is required or in natural systems in our uh, environment, we see lots of crop, uh, I mean plants, trees and shrubs and bushes. Are they asking us to feed? Are they asking us to protect? You see a, 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 an issue in horticulture that I always flag is papaya cultivation. The moment you start organized papaya cultivation, there will be a lot of viruses falling into it and a lot of uh, spraying stuff to do for vector management and still we fail to get a um, virus free crop. Okay, Chilies, many, many other crops. Same plants, if you see in the backyard of a 
uh, hostel or in some uh, area where unattended area is there, non-cultivated area is there. They don't have any virus, they don't have any pest. As we have to stop uh, at those points and uh, just see and observe what is that force which makes these plants better than crop the plants. Same crop plant, if it is living in the wild, they have a different uh, pestilence level in comparison to agricultural fields. So what I spoke earlier about the impedance of agrochemicals for, to influence the metabolism, the impedance of uh, various human interventions for uh, in, uh, bringing changes in crop plants to become, make them more susceptible. This is the last point I thought of uh, flagging in this uh, training program. I'm sorry I have spoken more than what my time allotment is, but I thought I should thank you all for giving me this opportunity to be with you all. Thank you once again. Goodbye. Any questions I can take? Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, one and all present here. So, on behalf of the organizing committee, uh, I would like to express my special thanks to Dr. T. P. Rajendra sir for his excellent presentation. Uh, we are honored to hear you, sir, today, and thank you for your enlightening speech on the various aspects like information gap in Indian situation about uh, pesticide chemistries, sequence of application status of gap in pesticide use. So the different tools of uh, crop protection, uh, including the latest one like drones, also different instruments of crop protection, crop cost of pest management to crops and environment, <clears throat> their maximum residual limit, and different farm, uh, sorry, farm production of microbial pesticides, which can be taken up as an entrepreneurship program by uh, young scientists and uh, many other different progressive farmers as well. So thank you so much for your insights. I appreciate you taking the time to share your valuable information with us. Thank you, sir, once again. Thank you. Thank you all. You have any session for questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank, you. Session, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your for delivering the keynote address. And we are really grateful for the time and effort that you took to share your thoughts and long experiences with pest management program before our participants. Now I re request our participants to take this great opportunity to interact with our TP Rajendram sir. So some of the people, uh, participants, five participants have given their names. They want to interact with you. If time permits, then I can move on. You are welcome. <clears throat> Ms. Monica Hazarika, please come to the dais and put your questions to sir. Otherwise, the microphone can be allotted to her. <laughs> You can come over, come over here. Hello, hello. Yes, please. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. First of all, thank you for your informative presentation. My name is Javanika Hajarika. I'm a PhD student in Department of Entomology, Assam Agricultural University. So my question is, which is the better strategy, targeting the pest or uh, focusing on strengthening the host plant immunity? Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> According to me, as a practitioner of plant protection for over four decades, I believe in susceptibility of plants. The antithesis of what you spoke. Okay. What is the antithesis? <clears throat> Every plant has the capability to defend itself. Okay, now, in spite of that, crops are seen to have a lot of invasions. Now, as much as what we talked about tolerance limits or tolerance levels of agrochemicals, what is the tolerance level of the grower in regard to the invasion of various organisms, be it disease causing or insects or mites or nematodes what is the tolerance level will you allow the crop to react and respond and elicit its defense and then support it with um, whatever tools we have in integrated pest management including agrochemicals to 
enable a, a betterment of defense. If you look at the original philosophies of IPM theory, <clears throat> what you said is the right thing, which is being touted for almost 100 years now. Modern agriculture went into a shortcut route of intensive production plan by using agrochemicals. When I say agrochemical, it includes fertilizers and hormones and uh, pest management tools. So, uh, realistically speaking, um, if you have the um, uh, a, a mindset to understand the crop plants plan of production in the beginning of the season, or as you become experienced in crop production, crop raising, it becomes almost near to natural farming. It's near to organic farming, whatever we now talk about, which is the right way of IPM. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Now, there's another question from Vinita Bora. Yeah, please. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, yeah, myself, Vinita Bora, is a scholar from the Department of Entomology, Assam Agriculture University, Johar. So we are really very thankful for your enlightening speech. In this context, I would like to raise a question on the future direction towards the pest management after 75 years of independence. Thank you. Oh, great. <clears throat> My lecture, I don't have notes with me right now. I can send it to you in new course. The philosophy is very well clearly ingrained that how much tolerant you are to the crop loss which we envisage or endure in crop fields is the beginning of your uh, practices from 75 years onwards of independence in decent commodity production. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Benita Bora. Now, part of our team does also has some question. Yeah, please. Uh, please go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, I am Parthiv Das uh, from the Department of Entomology. So my question is, what is your view on banned pesticides which are still in use in the Indian market? Well, ban is ban. Okay. That is a regulatory process. In fact, in, the, in practice, the government talks about phasing out of pesticides, not really ban. Okay. Can you give me an example which is in your mind when you spoke, uh, when you ask this question? One example. Chlorpyrifos is still is in use. Sorry to say it is not banned. Okay. It is not banned. Another pesticide, can you name again? Malachian is banned. No, sorry. It is not banned. If Malachian is banned, locust will come to your hut. <laughs> Please, next, another example. Yeah, so I got the clue now. You are referring to a draft notification of the government for banning or prohibiting the use of 27 pesticides, including these three which you mentioned. I am chairing a committee which is examining the entire notification by, I am appointed by the government for this purpose of introspecting whether what is to be done is right or wrong. Until now, how the law pro proceeds? A draft notification is just like a white paper kept in the blackboard. Anybody can read and go. Okay. React and do something if somebody has concern about it. But it is not to be implemented till the final notification is given. And the companies who are manufacturers are given a decent time of two to three years to phase out the production. These are all the procedures which we have to follow. Take the example of the uh, example which we would uh, always talk about in recent time of our life, endosulfan. Okay, there was a drop of hat by which everybody started blaming it and saying that it is a very dangerous, uh, miserable chemical. <clears throat> but still the government had to give about five years period for the manufacturers to face out this chemical and today it is banned and today you learn to in the market get endosulfide okay so it's a grow it's a slow process it's a process which has to be undergone because one fine morning you cannot shut your plants because a lot of raw material in inventories are available all these what will you do 
these are also dangerous chemicals if you consider the pesticide which is under question of ban is uh, to be removed all these in, uh, raw materials also to be removed where will you remove how will you remove this was the uh, plan, uh, story in, in the case of endosulfa so please realize that the current knowledge about those 27 pesticides which you are taking as um, banned or prohibited for use is unfounded okay take the example of uh, 4-h or um, some of those uh, erstwhile chemicals uh, we call them as erstwhile now because they were there used up to two years last today for it you are not able to get although you may get some labeled product which is not really for it in the name of that a uh, lot of wrong marketing or long production system may be there that is why universities have to come forward to analyze what are those products which are in the market Okay, thank you. Now, this is not this survey. Sir, you have a question. Good afternoon, sir. I am Surabhi Sarwala, PhD scholar from Department of Biochemistry, Chaudhary Charan Singh University, Isar. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your informative lecture and uh, one much benefited from whatever uh, information you have shared with us. So, my question was: Nowadays, we talk about the use of nano pesticides, nano fertilizers. So, sir, uh, are they useful in controlling the amount of chemicals that we are giving to the crops? In 1950s, ma'am, there was, I mean, after Rachel Carson's book, there was a publication which told a lady in the crop field in the US holding a small atomizer and pushing out some dust into the crop field. And then in 1950, two or 53 that publication is the visualization and dream was that should be the nanotization which we can expect and reach out for chemicals for various applications in our lives nanotization is a way of improving efficiency for all chemistry be it drugs in, including pharma products or pesticides or fertilizers we have made a small step, baby step, in the case of fertilizers and Kripco has, or some public uh, companies have come up with nanotized formulations of urea and DAP as the way Chancellor was explaining. In case of pesticides, the chemistries are more complex and nanotization is not so straightforward. But there are attempts going on for the formulants of the chemicals which are used for formulating the products uh, for nanotized uh, things but it's a long way to go I, I won't expect in another decade a product finally coming into the market for pesticide uh, purpose but the thinking process is as old as 50s and still the efforts are science uh, investigations are going on in various ways and adapted uh, research is also going on in agrochemicals in this field. Thank you. Uh, sir, I have one more question. Yeah. Uh, so when we talked, uh, so we talked about detoxification of the plants, like plants have certain system which has severe detoxification. Yes. So we uh, have studied that anthocyanins, which are the present, in, uh, which are present in the plants or the phenolic compounds, so they act as antioxidants for the humans. So, sir, are they also actors like potential antioxidants for the plants also against yeah. the pesticides? Yeah, this question is very interesting. You are opening a Pandora's box on detoxification physiology. Anthocyanin is one of the components as an output or metabolic um, you know, uh, out product of the plants of different species, be it... Uh, 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 of uh, you know tubers or leafy vegetables or whatever many sources are available for anthocyanin yeah these are for human consumption purpose called as antho antioxidants see <clears throat> the subatomic level process of detoxification is what science is now working on at cellular level subatomic process how the toxic atoms are being removed through enzymatic processes is what is being studied today in mitochondria or 
such as those organelles in the cells of plants. Now, even I am so ignorant about it to confidently talk about it in large ways. But I can abbreviate my discussion with you only on one point, that detoxification has been a mechanism or give, granted to all living organisms by the Creator for the sake of survivorship. And if you look at that point which I told you, toxins are toxic to all living beings. So, there is a need for in all living organisms where this pesticide or agrochemical is falling when you are applying it in nature. Nature means our farm ecosystem. <clears throat> And all of those organisms are subjected to the challenge of detoxification, including croplands. This is what I meant. So various mechanisms should be in operation to see that there is a removal of the toxic principle to those metabolites which will become less toxic or zero toxic. But it costs the plant a lot in terms of the energy to be expended, as much as what we humans have. Okay, so detoxification is energy intensive. So my question is, when you are applying these chemicals and you evaluate these agrochemicals for their efficacy, what we call as bioefficacy, do we have a yardstick to measure the detoxification or the metabolism in plants? Although we have some studies for uh, new chemistries whenever they are, uh, data generation is done, but plant metabolism is done only to the limited extent of which are the metabolites detectable while the active ingredient is alive in the crop plant tissues. Okay. We are not further probing it to the subatomic level, the fate of these metabolites or their uh, main uh, chemistry, whether they are still uh, being detoxified by the plant at nanogram level or picogram level. Okay. The energy requirement for this purpose is what my concern is. Suppose you stop using agrochemicals for a while, compare an experimental system of a long-term nature as what this, our friends in agronomy and soil science do, long-term manorial trial. Similarly, can we have a lot of agrochemicals, including fertilizers and hormones, and without that, a five-acre system in your farms, in your experimental areas, and compare the physiology of these plants, any crop species, and you see as much as what I have experienced with cotton for more than two decades, I realized that do nothing is equal to IPM. But as I explained to you earlier, your tolerance level of the crop loss, what you describe and define is the thumb rule for going into this system. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, Meghna Chaudhary. Good afternoon, sir. I am Meghna Chaudhary, master's student from the Department of Biochemistry and Agricultural Chemistry at Sun Agricultural University, Johan. Thank you so much okay. for your knowledgeable words today. Your lecture was very useful for us. I would like to ask, while exporting tea, do the use of pesticide affect the exportation? Yeah, this is a very difficult uh, issue of every tea producing country, including Africa and Asia. I have been involved uh, and I have my little finger in clarifying the world about the measurement of toxicity of chemicals in tea. And since you are a tea producing state and homestead tea gardens are very common in Johar region, I always, with the assistance and um, help of Toklai and other institutions, we have come up with a, an ideology that made tea, measurement of residues in made tea is the most stupid thing which we can imagine because that is not eaten. Although in Bengali we will say Kobe, Chai Kobe, but <clears throat> We never have this as a consumable item. We make a brew and that brew is what is consumed. If that is so, during this process of brew production, what is the fate of the pesticides which you have in comparison with the uh, made tea is what we have now currently made the world understand and codex including all agencies have approved 
that the pesticide residue in the brew is what is to be considered for MRL determination. So that is one knowledge part I wanted to convey. The other part is, yes, trade MRL if somebody is deploying for the sake of purchase of tea from Assam or any other part of Darjeeling or even South India, you have no handle to negotiate because our practices do not ensure a pre-harvest interval of use of pesticide. In small gardens, the insurance of uh, maintaining pre-harvest interval is very, very difficult. So the auctioning agencies or such of those procuring systems have to use some mechanism. As we have in cotton, a system where the fiber quality is ascertained in the machine. In two minutes, but if you put the fiber, the entire fiber property is red and given. Similarly, if tea has got a mechanism of the brew assessment, instant brew assessment process like an HPLC or such sort of instrument, which you people should design according to me, this issue of, uh, you know, um, terminal residues of pesticides in made tea or the brew tea is possibly to be addressed. And the last point which I may try to enthuse to all of you to work on in Assam Agriculture University is what is the life cycle of a pesticide in the made tea? Means today's made tea from a factory, when it will reach the table for consumption? And what is the fate of pesticide molecules that are recommended and deployed at consumption level on a table where we will have a breakfast or a dinner or a daytime tea happening. What is the life cycle? Do we have any thought about it? This is important. And in trade, this argument has to be brought in. And I am sure to apply like institutions, Dr. Barua and others are doing it. And this is one thing I always talk about when we talk about cereals and oil seeds. You know, you cannot say that uh, the pre-harvest interval which we have kept is the final word of the residues when you are storing these commodities in such harsh warehouses, harsh conditions, high temperature, with a pressure, when you stack it in gunny bags, what kind of pressure you are deploying onto the grains? And what is the fate of these chemicals at that pressure level and temperature level. Who will study this, ma'am? Please understand these kind of implications for before blaming agrochemicals. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mehta. Now the last question. So I request uh, Dr. Sumana Rachi to interact with sir. Uh, myself, Sumana Rachi, Assistant Professor from Department of Biochemistry and Agriculture Chemistry. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your valuable time and your valuable information which you have shared with us uh, today. Uh, I have uh, one question regarding CRISPR technology, sir. So how safe is this technology in the management of uh, crop pests? How unsafe you feel is the safety mechanism which we will have to think about. This I have a small question back to you. <clears throat> <laughs> Every day morning, we get up from bed and have an oral sanitation with a toothpaste. This example I quoted in Jorhat once upon a time, and I was addressing a set of journalists in Toklai. <clears throat> I want to repeat it because the risk which you are evaluating is based on the advantage and the um, you know benefits which we are visualizing from a product which we are trying to use. Be it CRISPR or any modifications which we are genetically envisaging for any benevolence, we need to weigh upon with the toothpaste we apply on a brush to in, uh, enforce oral sanitation once, twice or thrice as your uh, interest to keep the uh, uh, sanity, sanity and sanitation better. Okay, now, you know the toothpaste contains in the label, what all chemicals given there in the label, most of them are 
in uh, if you use in excess of what is being dosed mind you what is the dose of it a pesticide uh, of a toothpaste the brush bristle length for babies it is half of what adults have you will all will appreciate this point so the dosing is inherent in that quantity if you are using once or twice in a day the harm which is envisaged from those chemicals are minimized there is nothing called absolute zero risk at all in anything what we are using be it household detergents soaps or anything what we are handling in a daily life what we are trying to compromise is the benefits accrued with the harm or risk which we are visualizing as dr um, uh, jitender kumar was telling very explicitly the pico or uh, nano level pesticide residue detected by an hplc or hc lcms ms or any of those are they really harmful to health to be called as hazardous <laughs> is the final point which we have to keep in mind so crispr casper techniques all these are innovations for risk free systems to be generated with public approvals okay so we don't have to worry about a product which is which is in the anvil or which is being developed to be considered as very very dangerous or harmful or such as those and two things more i will add before i conclude and before i take leave of you one is as a consumer you have a label choice you read the products description of what it is and you can accept or reject the product that's one part this freedom is always given by the food safety system the second point which is more important is risk and hazard these two words are always being you know wantonly used in our uh, discussions in our uh, debates in our dialogues <clears throat> these are two events of the same kind okay hazard leads to risk risk is a measurement of hazard so if you toss the coin coin to assess about the danger and see whether you are looking at the hazard part of it or the risk part of it that is a choice which we like to go into risk assessment is the assessment of a comparative benefit being evaluated on the hazard which is perceived so toss your coin and decide whether casper is good or casper is bad thank you thank you sir thank you dr rajendram sir thank you dr smaina yeah wonderful time i had professor badal for uh, engaging me well yeah. and i'm very happy that i could be part of your uh, more sir we have some announcement sir your lecture has been viewed by more than 50 participants we have also done youtube streaming of your lecture and we'll send a link to you and sir our uh, course director dr anjumani devi say wants to hand over our your much like asamis gamosa on behalf of organizing committee i am accepting and i am offering you the partial work i will make necessary arrangement to send the asamis gamosa an organic tea that we have missed during morning times so that it should finish your new daily residence thank you sir thank you very much for being with us for more than four hours sir With this, I will wind up this uh, inaugural session, and I request Dr. Sunil Narati to make further announcement announcement to the participants. Thank you, thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Narati. Thank you, all present here. Thank you, uh, sir, for your nice lecture once again. And I would like to uh, announce here that we can uh, join here again uh, at say at the same venue at two thirty, and now we can disperse for lunch. and in the guest house uh vehicle is ready uh, in, 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 in. next next session will start here at 2:30 itself and vehicle is ready in front of the department we will go to the canteen for lunch